and, and you're not going to get it right away. But if you just start realizing this, that life actually doesn't care what you want. It doesn't care how you want it to operate. It doesn't care if you want it to be sunny or cloudy. It doesn't care if it wants you to make money or not make money. Life is just going to go ahead and give you a set of cards every hour. And you get to choose how you want to play those cards. You can choose to play those cards very pissed off, frustrated, and not accepting it. Or you can just learn to play the cards best based on how they're being dealt to you. Welcome to the Disruptance Podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric Forney and Michael Bounds. Every week on the show, we aim to disrupt the way real estate agents and entrepreneurs think about their business and life. And this week, we have a special guest, someone who I think is um, unusually disruptive and uh, someone who's been important in my life and in helping us build a disruptive business here in our market and now uh, a business partner of mine. And it's Adam Hergenrother. And so for those that don't know you, Adam, who are you? Well, I guess you can answer that question twice, right? <laughs> there's the, there's the, who am I? I'm, I guess I'm the one who sees and experiences life. But in terms of probably the question you're getting at is, is who in the roles that we play in this world? Um, you know, I, uh, I own a company called Adam Hergenrother Companies. And there's basically six major organizations that are there, about 800 people or so associated with those companies. Um, and, you know, the who am I question, right? That's a powerful one. I am not really good at many things. Um, in fact, I'm not really good at 99% of the things that um, when people see our organization, they give me credit for. Um, I am really good at um, maybe one thing or two things, which is being very disruptive, um, going after things that most people won't go after, setting a big vision, and then getting in relationship with really, really good partners like yourself. It is interesting because what I've noticed, you know, we have, we've had a three year working relationship and really what's amounted to be about 60 days of in business together. And one thing I've noticed and, and always knew about you is you lead from like above. You, you really don't get entrenched in the weeds and get your hands involved into a whole lot. So if, if I were to say, what are you really good at? It seems from my perspective, you're really great at seeing the battlefield from a high level and then helping people execute accordingly. Does that sound accurate to you? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's, it's, the thing is, is, you know, I always kind of explain it like this. If you're, if you're in the, if you're, if you are in the middle of the woods, right. And you're trying to figure out a way out which a lot of people are in business. They're, they're in the middle of the woods and they're trying to see a way to grow, right? Or advance or progress, right? And that's, or a way out of the woods, right? You know, if you're at the, at the woods, you may be able to see 20 or 30 yards in front of you. Where as you start, if you were to climb up the tree and maybe get in a tree stand, you're all of a sudden going to be able to see 150 yards. So you'd be able to spot, you know, potential areas of, of danger or bodies of water or whatever it is you're doing. Then if you were to elevate yourself above the trees, now you're seeing for miles, right? You now you can see for, you know, maybe even hundreds of miles, depending on the on the elevation that you're at and what you can see and if there's mountains or not. Then if you were to get into a plane, how big can you see? Then a you know, then a you know, then if you get up even to like a, a GPS type system, you know, uh, you know, going around the world, how how much can you see? And you see the entire world. And so at some point you realize that if while you still have your 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 pulse on what's happening in the organization the best role for you is to be the one who is actually seeing everything happen in the organization so that you can be prepared to help move the entire ship or parts of the ship or parts of the business to avoid any um you know challenges or uh, bottlenecks that the organization could potentially get into and if you're too far below or, or in the weeds of that you may not see it until it's too late or when you're seeing it, it's become so difficult to get out of it that it can wreck your, you know, your business for, you know, extended period of time. So leadership is one of the many things that I've learned over the last three years with you. And, um, and I, I think we've both changed a ton in the last three years. Do you remember, uh, by chance how we initially got partnered up as far as from a coaching perspective? I don't. Okay. So this is whole, yes, this is so funny to me. So I'm one of those people, you know, who doesn't exactly just like put myself out there. And the last thing I would do is like write an essay to apply for something. But I remember I saw a post on Facebook and, that you had like one spot for a coaching candidate. 
And uh, Hallie made me write an essay as to why it should be me. And so last weekend at Project U, I went back and looked at what that um, essay said and, and what it was that caused me to like actually take action to want to a- apply to coach with you. I want to read it to you because it's kind of funny. Uh, in talking with it, Matt Kelderman was like, well, no wonder that Adam said yes to coaching together. He couldn't have like written this thing better himself. So in 2018, I put that uh, I'm a self-admitted internet stalker who finds real estate agents more inspiring than rock stars. And as a result, I spend a large portion of my day learning and growing online from great agents and leaders like Adam. I started in real estate in 2014 and uh, got 127 closings in 2016. In 2017, we began growing the team with two agents and we'll close uh, 200 plus units for 40 million. I have bigger goals for 2018. And I believe most coaches can coach me and my team on the fundamentals we need for 300 plus units, but only a few have the ability to teach me how to be a great leader, to think bigger and to inspire others like Adam does around him. And so while I'm interested in learning about coaching from Adam, more importantly, I'm interested in the personal growth, the leadership growth and the business growth that I need in order to compel others to accomplish their goals and exceed their own. And so I feel like I would be a good fit to discuss this potential opportunity to learn those from Adam. And you've delivered on that. And uh, and so for that reason, thank you. You've been an instrumental player in my career, in my life. That's, that's well received. But that was, a, I mean, I, I actually remember reading that now. Um, now okay, when you, okay. When you just read that there. Um, and it wasn't easy, yes. And the thing about you um, is that you are actually very, you, you meant that genuinely in terms of your ability to be coached in the personal growth arena. And yeah, you were, yeah. you didn't, you didn't allow the conversation. You didn't run away from the conversation that you knew you needed to have. Um, and sometimes um, you, you know, people know what they're running away from. Like we just said this in the, earlier today, where it's, you know, you can't, there's going to be pain in your life, either pain from mediocrity or pain from growth. And you knew that there was going to be some changes that you needed to happen in your life and you took it head on. Um, and so for that, that's, it's amazing. And, and who you've become has been pretty awesome to watch. Yeah, thank you. And I know change is something that all of us resist, unless it's the change that we want, right? And and we're seeing a lot of people resisting change in real estate right now. And then we're seeing people lean into change right now. And, you know, personally, we've we've changed a lot from a business standpoint by by partnering with you. And so share with me what your vision looks like for the real estate industry in the next, you know, 12 to 24 months and why collaboration beats competition right now? That's a wonderful question. You know, I think in real estate, I think people are starting to wake up and realize that while everyone keeps talking about disruption happening, it's actually happening. Um, And I think the next 12 to 18 months are gonna be a very eye-opening experience for a lot of people. And it'll happen. The thing is when something starts boiling to a point, it boils for a while until all of a sudden it just blows the roof off. And I think we're getting close to that boiling point where things start tipping over and, you know, the water starts seeping out of the, out of the pot. So for real estate, it's, there will be three or four major platforms and I'll define platform in a second, but there'll be three, four major platforms that emerge um, that become the dominant players for the next, you know, 20 to 30 years um, in, in real estate. Real estate is about the change the way we interact with um, uh, clients and see the industry as a whole is about to change. What agents can do to prepare themselves for this change. Um, and also what, what they can also do for um, really being part of the change, um, which we're going to talk, talk about. But I think first and foremost, you have this this people use this word platform now, or at least we started using it. Um, platforms, basically what they are is they're going to be, if you think about a Venn diagram, which a Venn diagram is just s- two circles, how they interlap in the, ha- interlap in the middle, for if you're not, people not familiar with that. Um, so you have consumers and you have agents. And I consider what our organization is, sits right in the middle of that Venn diagram, which is a platform, which basically allows consumers to go to a platform for everything related to real estate. So this is what in 12, to 18 months, you'll wake up and it'll look like this. A consumer comes into your platform 
and or they're already in your platform and now they're being marketed to for some reason. The consumer may not want to buy or sell a home, but they may want to refinance. Great, they refinance in your platform. They may not want to buy or sell a home, but they want to renovate their room. Great, you have a vendor relationships and can take care of all that and set that up for them with the local contractor that can get them to them. They may want to buy or sell a house. Great, your entire platform can service that as well too. You know, they when they buy a home, they will be linked up to having a group come in there and help upload their entire home to set up their electronics, to help them move, to help them their Amazon accounts, get all that stuff sophisticated and done for them. There's companies already disrupting that space right now. So if you go move into a home, you can hire a company to come in there and do all that. That's going to be part of the overall uh, platform and package that consumers are going to expect to have in a very short period of time in real estate. So it's an all-in-one real estate platform. So it really is supporting the consumer. And and really the thing is, is you're not even going to have, well, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, from a branding standpoint, when consumers work with your brand, they won't even have to be explained by the agent what the brand does. The brand itself will speak to it. Like people don't go and ask an Amazon rep if they have you know, um, a certain type of product. They just expect that it to be there, right? You just go there and it's an expectation. Now that'll happen over time, but but what we'll start to first see is consumers just they go to the brand that we're building, and then all of a sudden when they when they go to this brand, they just they know everything is there. So it's all in one stop shopping in real estate, and that may even morph to beyond real estate. Um, you know, you know, connecting some additional spokes beyond that first tire. But for starters, that that's what'll happen in the disruption of the service. Um, I also, by the way, think too many people talk about this in real estate. Um, but construction is disrupting its its well too. And I think that'll actually be a part of it, whether it's construction for renovations, construction for brand new houses, um, how that looks in terms of using an efficient equipment to having the delays in, in the in the bottlenecks in the construction industry right now are so damaging um, to an industry that there's going to be a lot of technology that comes out that helps, you know, 3D printing and different things like that to really yeah. help kind of support yeah. that uh, in there. You know, those are two of the most antiquated industries, and they amount to be the largest storehold of wealth, right? And and that's residential housing. And I was trying to think, what was the last innovative thing the construction industry has actually done? Maybe poured concrete foundations or spray foam insulation. I mean, it, it has one of the most antiquated and least evolved businesses, and it's contributing to what the market looks like now with with a lack of innovation. So as somebody who builds at a, at a big scale, is there anything innovative even on the horizon in that industry? Hey, you know, what's really interesting, Eric, is when you break down the construction industry, there is, um, there's a lot of bolt on pieces that are trying to help out with the antiquated services. Very similar, by the way, if you look at this to what happened in real estate brokerages, there was a lot of bolt on pieces that try to help change the industry. Now we're realizing that we're taking, there's a big technology graveyard in real estate right now, right? And all the best pieces from all the technology graveyards, like in an industry, right? Have been, have now been applied and are now pushing forward the change there. And we see that with construction too. There's been a lot of bolt on, like you said, spray foam insulation, um, you know, the type of siding people use, they're using something called what's called LP smart siding now, which is a, a much larger product, easier to use. You know, the shingles people use have relatively been the same for a while. Um, you know, so all in, you know, Elon Musk's, you know, company was trying to change what even shingles look like, right? So a lot of bolt on stuff, but fundamentally, the, the main challenge in construction um, is going to come from the time frame that it takes to actually build a house and the labor that goes into it. People aren't coming out of college and say, I want to build a house. So the labor shortage is becoming much and much, much more difficult. So what we're going to see is we're going to see some sort of panelization, either that's 3D printing or built almost in sections in houses, which we've already been doing some of this, and then it gets erected. The house gets fully erected in a very short period of time. I firmly believe that there will be the, the biggest disruption of this will be um, some sort of 3D printing for the actual framing of the house on site. Um, like you'd set something up and they basically be able to create it and it'll come out from there and it'll build. Now, what you can do to prepare yourself for that is um, ensuring that uh, you own the land because that's something that we're not making more of 
at least not for the next 30, 40, 50 years right now. Um, that'll still be something that people can hold on to, but there is going to be major disruption in the construction industry. I think that'll happen after the real estate brokerage industry, by the way. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a huge undertaking. We're hearing you talk about construction. It makes me think about what a platform looks like in real estate is almost like being a general contractor, but when all of the, the, all those services and all of those, um, moving related components are inside of the, the general contractor umbrella. That's what the platform of real estate looks like, right? Is where the, where at, at HRG, we become the general contractor, the expert in the process that, that then is, you know, facilitating the move, facilitating the insurance, facilitating the real estate closing, the mortgage, all of those things. It's leveling up the education and the service that real estate agents have to provide, which means the consumer experience is that much better, but the agents have to be equally better. So what's the person, that, what, what person is HRG looking for? Like who, like who would be the ideal person that fits into that mold who could contribute into a real estate platform like ours? Yeah. Um, you know, I can answer that from a, from two different levels. Number one, I think the real estate agent that is coming into play into the next generation is somebody who's very, very, very consultative. Um, they're actually have a fiduciary responsibility that's actually applied um, to really sit down and understand a lot of logistics that way, which that's why I think there will be a reduction in the number of agents. I don't know to what number yet, um, but there will be because um, people with technology and these big platforms will be able to handle a lot more servicing of it themselves um, versus, uh, versus, you know, you know, agents doing three or four transactions. I think that'll go away. I think the agent will ultimately end up in a very short period of time, end up doing 50 plus transactions, you know, individually as an agent through technology and through these platforms, which then eliminates a lot of people who just got into it to, to get, to get money, which is nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but um, it'll eliminate a lot of that for people who are really passionate about the real estate industry and helping transform lives, which is one of the things that we're passionate about. Um, what, we're, what we're looking for is people who want to be on this journey. You know, it's really interesting when you, when you, when there's disruption in any industry, you don't really realize it's being disrupted until you actually look back on it. And right now it's being disrupted and people have a front row seat to it. You know, and I think that's one of the things that's really exciting and how we're growing so much at HRG right now is because people are starting to realize like, hey, we actually are doing this. <laughs> like this isn't, you know, I've been visualizing this and having a vision for this for 11 years. And really over the last year, you can see it and agents can feel it. Um, our leadership teams can feel it. Our executive teams. I mean, you've joined, you know, our executive team, Eric, so that like, you can, you can see that you, you're, you know, as head of industry for our organization, you can, you're, you're looking at this a lot and, and you can see these different things. So the, the team, you know, the people that kind of bring into our platform are people who want to be part of this disruption. They want to be part of a platform. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And that's the number one thing that, that we see with people partnering with us. And if we're partnering with, you know, a hundred to 300 million a month in people bring, you know, in production, the biggest thing that we see is people saying, Hey, you know what? I'm sick of doing this myself. I'm lonely. If I'm really honest with myself, I'm lonely. And I, while I, while I'm still making great money, uh, I'm just, I'm done. Like I, I, I thought I could, I thought there'd be something more to end of this road. And I'm realizing that I want, I want the road to be extended. And so when they join a big platform, that road now opens up to multiple highways. Where do they want to take it? What platform they can use? You know, a team can come in there that's doing 50 million. We get it running to a, to a degree where they're having to do less involvement in the team because the platform itself is servicing the team and servicing the consumer. Then they can go out there and then expand into other little air, geographic areas or whatever it is that they want to do into other forms of business if, they, if that's what they choose to do. So we're looking for people who want to be part of that journey and who really want to be, um, you know, using business as this conduit for personal growth, using business as a conduit for gaining financial wealth, using business as a way to, um, you know, grow in every aspect of your life. And ultimately, you know, if we look at, you know, the, the words that kind of make up HRG, it's truth, right? It's health, it's wealth and impact. And truth is, is really understanding where you serve best. Right. And that's what we try to put people in there and, and living that authentic life, not the authentic life where I put a badge on and can be mean to people and say, I'm living authentic. That's not it. It's really that authentic life of 
being honest with yourself of what you're really good at and what you're not. And if you're lonely, then that's the thing. And how do we switch that into it? And then that health is really important for all of us to make sure that, you know, as agents, we're in leaders that we're, we're focused on that as well. Yeah, Adam, I was reading there was a study uh, just yesterday where it said that Americans have fewer friends than they've had in the last 50 years. And it's, it seems that technology and longer work days are, are pushing people towards um, time with their family and spending more time with their work colleagues. And so, yes, statistically, people are lonelier than they've ever been. And the pandemic, of course, exacerbated that trend. Um, and I mean, for us, it, you know, I looked at it and said, how do I get further faster? And how do I do it with people that think like me and um, people who I enjoy going to work with? If I'm investing this much time in what I do, how do I do it with people that I like? And so for somebody who's like still held back to be um, partnering with a platform like ours or like any others, what do you see as the thing that holds them back the most? Yeah, there's two things that hold people back the most. Number one, uh, it's control. <laughs> Surprising, right? The people really want to be in control of their little baby in and that's fine right and you know it's not for everybody but one of the things that i'll tell people about control is is that control um actually healthy and what i mean by that is your control is actually limiting the business because when you want to control something you're only you're controlling it to a point where you feel like you can control it and then you're actually stifling the old your own organization from growing until you actually let go of that level of control that I'm referring to there. There are measurements you can have in place that you can always control, but you're letting go of you needing to be involved and controlling every aspect of that. And by the way, that's exhausting. And if you're real, it's exhausting to try to hold on to every piece of that versus just holding on to the pieces that that's why we go back to that truth, the truth word, right? Holding on to the pieces that are really going to have an impact that you can make. And when you break it down for people that way, they go, yeah, you're, you're right. I wish I didn't have to do all this stuff, but then they go back to the, like, but I need the control. And then the second component of that is, is, is related to ego, which is just an egoic level of consciousness, which is that control piece anyways, of them just wanting to, Hey, I want to do this myself. And what I explain to people is I totally get that. And the question is, is I promise you by just partnering the platform, it's not going to make it so that you don't get to have your own growth path. <laughs> you will. It, it's just going to be, it's going to be exasperated. It's going to be, you're going to have more support, more contribution and more impact. I thought you were going to say ego is the thing that holds people back. And I think that, that in my experience, that's the thing that I've encountered with people that, are, that have that fear of like letting go of themselves or their brand. How do you help people work through that? Because it's such a big topic, but I know that's obviously what your podcast is all about, right? Is the idea of letting go of your ego and your identity in order to be a limitless um, business competitor. So what do you tell the person who's, who's stuck still in that phase of clinging for control and ego? I was on a call yesterday with um, uh, the top 50 agents in the country and somebody actually asked me that exact question. They said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm struggling really with letting go of, you know, I've got some agents, but I'm letting go of the client wanting to be with me. You know, they have to be with me. And there's, so there's a couple of things I always ask. I said, well, hey, the first question I asked is just on the client relationship. And they went into like letting go of their whole business because that's really what it, I just dug deeper. And that's really what it was. But the, the thing they use the client as kind of like the surface kind of, you know, you know, soft pitch, if you will. And so I said, hey, who's the number one, you know, agent next to you? And, and they said somebody's name. And I said, well, great. I said, well, what if you went and hired that person as your listing agent? Would you give up control of the listings? And they're like, well, of course I would. <laughs> and so what I just, and then they stopped and everyone started laughing because he just said it without even realizing he answered his own question. It just comes down to one, being in a relationship with really good people. Number two, clients aren't interested in you. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell everybody that. They're not interested in you. And if you think they are, that's not actually accurate. What they're interested in is your systems, your models, your service, your product, right? And in, in the streamlined ability of get to get what they've asked you to do done. And I think that is, that is really, really important for people to understand. You've gotten so much done, obviously. You said you run six businesses. When did that finally click? Because you had to have been out of control at some point, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it's funny when I instantaneously, when I got into real estate in 2006, within a, within a first probably 30 or 40 days, I just said, 
how do I find somebody to do all the stuff that I don't want to do? So I wish I had like some better answer to say it was like some magical moment. It just was really ingrained in me that I'm inherently actually lazy when it comes to, and I just realized it's actually a really powerful leadership tool. As long as it's harnessed, right. It wasn't harnessed right in the beginning part of my life. And I ended up gaining a hundred pounds and a hundred pounds overweight and in the drugs. And so that made that contributed to its own problems. But when I started actually harnessing that ability, and when I say inherently lazy, to define that I'm inherently lazy when it comes down to um, things that somebody else can do that they can do better than me. If it's something that only I can do like exercise or meditation or eating healthy. I mean, I am a 100% laser focused on that. But when there's anything else, like in business, it's very easy to see this. There was other things that people could do better than me. I just didn't have a problem giving that to them early on. So I never struggled with that. And so I went through a bunch of different assistants early on in my career because I didn't know how to hire. And that was a problem. And I had to learn how to hire. But then I just started letting go more and more and more. And the better way of saying it is just, I just literally wanted to get to a point where, you know, I was doing 5% of my activity was contributing to 95% of the organization's success. Um, and so I just kept slithering away parts of my job and firing myself from those components and putting people in there that were much better than me. And it is that you can feel like a fraud. You can feel like an imposter. I went through all of that where it's like, oh, what if they find out it's that I'm not really good enough? Or what if they find out that, you know, that I've just hired people that are better than me? Or is anybody going to need me? And the answer is always that they need you. <laughs> the general manager of a team in sports is not better than the player, but they need the general manager. I mean, Phil Knight who wrote 11 rings. And I love his book was not better than, you know, Michael Jordan or, you know, or Larry Bird or any of those guys that they played with. Right. What he was, was he was a better at aligning and pulling everyone together and getting everyone to row in the same direction. And that's what won championships. You had to be okay with letting things get chaotic, right? If you said you hired the wrong people, you've had um, chaos in your in your local business, right? And when you were running a team um, and you were trying to expand originally, got, I think you told me your first expansion market um, or, or at least one of the early ones uh, folded uh, shortly before like one of the meetings that you had. You've had growth challenges in your personal life. Uh, from a from a relationship from a parenting standpoint how did you just become okay with the chaos yeah it's a very deep question um ultimately my starting position in life is that i really need nothing from life but i'm happy to enjoy everything that comes from life and the reality is is once you can actually truly understand that and, and you're not going to get it right away. But if you just start realizing this, that life actually doesn't care what you want. It doesn't care how you want it to operate. It doesn't care if you want it to be sunny or cloudy. It doesn't care if it wants you to make money or not make money. Life is just going to go ahead and give you a set of cards every hour. And you get to choose how you want to play those cards. You can choose to play those cards very pissed off, frustrated, and not accepting it. Or you can just learn to play the cards best based on how they're being dealt to you. You know, people that win poker championships don't have better hands. They play them better. People that have different levels of joy in their life don't have better uh, cards than you do. It may look like it on the surface, but they don't. They just play the cards better than you do. And that's what really is really stuck with me in my life is I'm going to wake up and my starting position is I'm alive. I'm spinning around on the middle of this planet in the middle of nowhere in this galaxy, I'm pretty sure I can handle a phone conversation. I'm pretty sure I can handle that challenge over there. And, if, and at the end of the day, if it starts getting really tough, I always go back to, I'm 39 years old. I'm going to die soon, right? I don't know when that is, but every day I get a little closer to that. We all do, right? And so I just remind myself that it gives a little bit more of like, okay, let's not take any of this so serious but still be focused on building. I love business building. I love agents. I love the real estate industry. It's, it's such a warms my heart to be part of all of this disruption. But at the end of the day, 2000 years from now, a thousand years from now, people aren't going to know who we are. They're not going to know what we did. And so it's just an illusion to that point is you show up, you do what you can do and you use business as this conduit to grow. Yeah, it's interesting. I have to let go of control in this conversation. We're we're having our mid year advance, and we're at this like Dave and Buster style like environment. And if you see on the video on the live stream, we have the Papa Shot turning on behind me, and like all these arcade games going bananas right now. And I'm trying to 
trying to be present in the conversation. And that's, I think, one of the things I've learned from you is to be present where I am. And so there's nothing better at understanding presence than having children. What have you learned from your kids? You know, people asked me early on, like, what were the books that I read that really helped me with parenting? And one of the, and I, I read a couple of them. There's some good ones. You know, I started thinking about this and realized that for thousands of years, we've been raising kids. And so there's like a biological switch that happens um, that just all of a sudden starts putting us into a different path for the majority of us. And, it's, and it starts that we start to take care of it ourselves. Like we just know what to do once we're in those type of positions. Um, so that was kind of an interesting paradigm because like you think you can prepare and prepare and prepare. Then once you actually have a kid, something switches in you. And you start seeing life differently. You start, I started taking less risks <laughs> for one. Um, and I started, I started realizing that like, I can't just go put this person away. I actually remember when I was driving out of the hospital with my first daughter, I have three kids under nine and, uh, and my first daughter. And I remember getting on this little interstate and I looked back in my rear view mirror right before the light turned green. And I go, wow, like I have this child back there that nobody else is responsible for, but me. Right. And it's, well, me and my wife, but it's like, it's, it's our, like, it's not like a dog. It's not like you can put it away. Like it's now there with us. And so something switches in those moments that you biologically start taking over. But, you know, kids have also taught me a lot early on in their lives about what it's like to be free. And when I mean free, I mean free from egoic level of needing the world to be in a certain way and how just fresh. That's why when you talk to a child, they can say whatever they want. There's no energy behind it. You know, the other day, my daughter said a swear word, like one of the big bad swear words. She's like, yeah, I heard them say F, right? And she said it and she said it, but she didn't say it with any energy. It was like she would just say like banana, like she just said it. And I was like, wow, see, there's, we, we get so wrapped up in the language and she just said it like it could have been anything. Like, why, why is that a bad thing to say? Right. And so just the innocence of what they are and how much we can take in as children. And then also it's taught me, um, grace, humility. It's taught me that um, spirituality to me just means that there's something larger than you and that you, and that's one of the things that my kids taught me right off the bat was how there's something way more than you. And because it's no longer just about you, it's a lot, it's about everybody else that's around you in your life. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things you've talked about your kids um, teaching for you is that presence too, right? Is like, they're really aware when you're not in conversation or when you're not really connecting with them. We're just so used to being adults and, and not connecting with people that we almost rarely notice that we're not authentically ourselves with someone. And, and kids don't let you have that much of a leeway, it seems like. It's funny. Um, it's not funny. It's interesting you mentioned that. In, in Oprah's new book where she wrote, um, What Happened to You? Um, basically, people, instead of uh, instead of when you see somebody acting up, you don't go, Hey, I wonder what's wrong with Eric, right? You go, Hey, I wonder what happened to Eric. And so it's just a different question, but they actually have a lot of studies now that shows that, um, like with kids, particularly under five of you not showing them attention, they develop their brains develop are actually starting to develop problems with that because you're like, yes, I'm paying attention, but not paying attention. The kid doesn't understand like that, like, and as an adult, if you're having a conversation and somebody picks up their phone and starts doing it, you intellectually can understand what they're doing. You may not like it, but you can intellectually understand that kids can't. So they're going, huh, is that normal to just shut off? Right. So that's what some of the things they're doing in this research is really interesting showing that. So what I do with my kids as an FYI, I try to be very focused. Like yesterday, my son came to work all day and he made these braces. He ended up making like $80, by the way. It was pretty funny because I think you Dude, he's a hustler. <laughs> He makes money from everyone. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was so interesting to see his it's just affiliation um, for wanting to, to be in business. And so we got to talk a lot about it, but he kept coming over to me and I said, hey, buddy, I love you. But right now I need to be really engaged in my work. Um, and that was part of our agreement for coming here. And he's like, okay, that's right. It makes sense. So I gave him his detention, understood what we were doing. And I said, and I gave him timeline. I said, I need 90 minutes to go do this. You've got your stuff set up over here. And he go, yep, high five. We're good. So there's, it doesn't mean we have to sit there and look at our kids' eyes every second, right? It just means that when you're going to go spend time with them, put your phone away, right? For a period of time. It doesn't have to be forever. You can just go to them and say, hey, next 30 minutes, I'm all yours. What would you like to do? And you just mentally, remember we talked about strategically, maybe not today, it's either be strategically engaged or fully disengaged. Um, 
And I think that becomes powerful for people when you're fully engaged with somebody, be fully engaged with them. And when you're not engaged, be strategically disengaged from those particular things. But you're making sure that people understand what the two differences mean. And that's one of the things that you're really good at, right? And one of the things I think is that you make your time count differently. And that was one of the things that if you go back and read what I originally wrote that I wanted to learn from you. How does somebody differentiate between boundaries and asshole? Because there's a really thin line, it seems like, between setting great expectations and just being a jerk. Well, I think number one, it comes back to the word selfish. And I think there's, you can have bad being, you can have bad selfish and you can have good selfish. And I think it kind of goes to speaking to what you're asking. Like the bad selfish is like, Hey, I'm just going to sit on my couch. Somebody should give me money. Somebody should just take care of everything for me. They should do this. And I'm just going to just be lazy with my, with myself and, but everyone else should take care of me. That's kind of like a bad selfish, right? But selfishness has a, as a, as a derogatory term. I think we need to change that around because instead of masking it, like, Hey, we need a girl's night or a guy's night or a, some alone time. We, that's just being selfish, right? I mean, Michael Jordan was selfish with his time right? Steve Jobs was selfish with his time. And, and really what that does is the question becomes this, Eric, if you're, se- are you being selfish with your time to contribute to the whole, or are you being selfish with your time for you? <laughs> and I don't mean you in the way of self-care. I mean, you in the way of like, it's just because I want to be lazy and I want selfishness. Selfishness to go and exercise for yourself is contributing to the whole. And I don't care in business, that can be in your personal life. You as a father or a mother, right, or a caregiver, you go exercise, you're a better parent, period, right? You just are. You're a better business leader. You're a better friend, right? If you grow every day by reading some books and taking time for yourself to be selfish for 30 minutes to read, that contributes to the whole, right? As you teach people, as you learn people, if you are learning or in a class or reading podcasts or, you know, building something and you're using that as a contribution, then being selfish is something we all need to be more of because we end up losing in touch with how we grow and we focus on other people way too much. Um, And so being selfish with your time, actually, I look at that as being the best attribute to help everybody. I also believe, and this is more spirituality, but the, the greatest gift that you can give to humanity is to wake up, which requires a tremendous amount of selfishness and by wake up you mean to be aware right and to, to understand that you are not you right there are there are multiple versions of you right there's the the awareness that your identity is not necessarily who you are and you you wear several hats every day how do you just how do you define that waking up well, it's a, it's a big term right now. People are using mindfulness, waking up, present moment. And really all of that means, and, and just to distill this down to make it very simple for people because language can be complicated, particularly when we have different interpretations and meanings of it. But really to just break this down at a granular level, waking up just means I'm no longer listening or paying attention to some thought that's in my mind that is, is, is Velcroing me or capturing me away from actually interacting with life. I'll give you a couple examples of this. You know, the, the ego, which people think more of the ego as like some bravada, like, look at me, I've got a big ego, look at the car I'm driving, house and this, I'm shouting, right? And that's a form of egoic level of consciousness. But egoic level of consciousness can be the exact opposite. It can be renunciation, right? It can be not doing any of that. It can be going away from money. It can be going towards money. All ego means, if you're coming from ego, it means that you who is in there, there's a subject-object relationship, we all have that voice inside our head. It's you are paying attention to that voice. You are holding on to some image. You're paying attention to some future event that's going to occur. You're holding on to some past event. All of that means that you're you're just not actually there for life. You're like even today, like right now, as you're listening to this podcast, are you really listening to me or Eric? Or are you listening to the mind narrate this conversation for you? So waking up or mindfulness, just all that means is I'm a, the first step is just, I'm aware that I am not always there. <laughs> like when you go and you yell at your partner during that time, you're yelling at your partner. I understand you couldn't control that. It just happened. Then when you gain control and you come back aware, you go, Hey, I'm so sorry for acting that way. I don't know what came over me. Well, what came over you is you became a goic level of consciousness. That's all ego means. And the same thing for eating. It's like you wake up in the morning. You're like, I'm not going to eat those chips tonight. 
Then all of a sudden at seven o'clock at night, you find yourself can't even stop going towards those chips to have a few, right? And then the, the minute you have a few, you're going, why did I eat those? Right. And so you just, you, you kind of, then the morning you have more, more stability, more awareness and you go, I'm not gonna eat those again. Right. So waking up mindfulness just means I'm no longer going to allow that voice or some collection of thoughts or ideas um, or images r actually run in my life, or you can put an eye in there and ruin your life. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wake up to the present moment. You know, think about times where you're engaged in speaking events or training, or if you're maybe engaged with your kids, uh, or if you're playing sports, I like to tell people like when you're skiing or snowboarding, when you get into that flow moment, you're not using your mind anymore, right? You're just actually in the moment and, and life knows what to do. It's taking care of it. And so that's what we mean by waking up in mindfulness. And as you, as you do that, you don't lose this edge. That's so many people are afraid to go down this path. They're like, but I'm going to lose this edge. I'm not going to be as strong anymore. I'm not going to gain those things. And it's like a coat, right? It's like you can always put on that edge. It's just controlled. <laughs> so if you need to go turn on part of you, you can put on that coat to go turn it on. It just, you know, Tim Ferriss gave this example. He said, he likes to look at that question as like wearing a smoker's jacket. You wear a smoker's jacket to go in and have a cigar, but it'd be really weird to have your smoker's jacket on in the middle of the gym or in the middle of a conference or in the middle of Dunkin' Donuts having your smoker's jacket on. So you turn, you, you, it's got a purpose for it, but you take it off. And what the mindfulness and awareness will do is, is broaden your horizon to see the world differently. So you can see where, where you're acting from egoic level of conscious. And then you can become aware of that and start working on that path. And that's personal growth. I want to try to hammer out the last couple of minutes here, a couple of quick questions. So if somebody um, was picking three profits and that's profits with a PH, right? Gary tells us to, to we get to pick our profits, right? And who are the profits that you uh, would pick if you could only pick three? Well, I think Warren Buffett in business slash investing. I don't think there's anybody better than him. You know, ultimately what Warren does, and Eric, I know you know this, that guy just invests into really good companies it then makes them a little bit better based on his platform. And so I just think yeah. that's from an investing yeah. standpoint, and he's always like, go after 20% a year, right? Um, you know, it's fast. I think 95 or 96% of his wealth came after the age of 60, like 90% came after 50. So it's just a comp. And he started when he was like 11. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. He's really like the success of compounding habits. It, it's, it's good decisions made every day compounded over 80 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. Then the, the second one would be Michael Singer, um, who's a friend of mine. Um, he is, he wrote the book untethered soul and the surrender experiment. But what I really like about Michael is he's very, he's actually built, people don't necessarily know this about him unless you read his books, but he, he built a multi-billion dollar company and sold it and has made a tremendous amount of money, never really changed his life ever. And is still dedicated to keeping his temple open and it's called the temple of the universe. And he was the first person to really help me go down deep in terms of untethering yourself, which is another form of waking up, right? Untethering your soul from you. Um, and he goes really, really deep into what spirituality is, but he says it in such a way that it resonates very well for me. There's a lot of people that have said what he said over the years, but the, the way he brings in stories and the way he says it with, with not caring whether or not you like it or not, he could care less. Um, just very, very, it resonates well with me. And I think with millions of other people as well too. So, um, he, he would, he would definitely be one. And then, you know, I would be remiss to not to say, you know, Gary Keller is a, is a prophet of mine, um, for many reasons, because he was one of the individuals who actually started sharing and showing me how to actually get out of my own way, <laughs> how to fire myself, how to build a business and also how to do it with ultimately without sacrificing my time, um, and, and, and not just going after money. And he early on saw that I could be, I could go down that path. So he just said, why do you want money? Why do you want money? Why do you want money? Not that it's bad, not that it's not good, but just be very clear on, you know, your money and what it looks like and having a holistic approach to life. I think he was one of the first business people that I met even before Michael Singer that showed me that you can actually, you know, actually the first time I ever met Gary, uh, in terms of person was in 2009 and up until then for three years, I had thought business was something it was in my mind. I just kept going, I can't, nobody's shown me this path. Nobody's shown me this, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing. And finally I went in the first five minutes of being with Gary in this special invite. He wasn't talking to me directly. He was just talking to like 50 people. He actually gave me permission to be me. 
which was basically to go out there and not do everything myself. And I know it seems like we've gone, it's elementary now, but in 2009, that was mind blowing to me of being like, wow, I can go hire somebody to go build all this thing. Awesome. And it was the first person that told me like, you got to go work hard. You got to do it yourself. Right. And, and I was just surrounded by people that didn't really subscribe to that, not because they wouldn't, but because nobody actually helped them. Um, and so he, he helped me immensely get on that path. So then what I heard you say is that he taught you to fire yourself and look for your replacement. And so who are your replacements or who are you looking for? Well, I mean, ultimately you're looking for people who share your, your vision, which in, in your mission. And for us, it's, we're an organization that executes that we follow models and we grow personally. And that personal growth can be expanded to a whole bunch of spokes. But those are the three pillars of our organizations is built on. And we use those words, right? Truth, health, wealth, impact in those, in those ways as well too. So we're looking for people who abide with that. Look, we don't have to like hunting. We don't have to like mountain biking. We don't have to like Ironmans. We don't have to agree in the same politics. We don't actually have to, um, you know, even agree on the same shows that we like or have the same lifestyles or get up early or not get up early or stay up late or not stay up late. That's irrelevant to me. What we're looking for people is who tip the scales with 51% culture, 49% profit. And ultimately at the end of the day, people typically tip the scales the one or two. They tip it with, with culture, which means that something's bigger than them. They want to do something together that's bigger than just them. And they understand that and they're willing to put that first. Conversely, 49% profit, money drives a lot of things. So we understand the importance of model following, of execution to drive the profit. You can, if you're 90% culture, maybe an amazing place to go, but you don't really get anything done, right? You may be 90% money and you may make a ton of money, but it's not really a fun place to grow. And so we, we balance this out by saying for at least for us in our world is we want people that join us that are 51% in culture, 49% profit. So we all come together so we can, we can execute, we can grow financially, we can grow personally, spiritually, all these different categories that are really, really important in our lives that all of them were focused on so that we can go out there. And at the end of the day, whenever that happens to be for any one of us, we can just say, Hey, you know what? Every day I live, learn and play. Well, Adam, um, I'm really grateful for getting to uh, live and uh, and work and play with you. It seems like it's all the same thing most days for me. And uh, and so um, I, I've learned a ton and, and grown by being a part of the organization. And I know that uh, the amount of impact that we're going to create in the next 24 months is going to really help a lot of people. And, um, and there's probably going to be a lot of growth involved with it, too. And so that's the fun part of it. A lot of uncontrolled growth, I have no doubt. That's, that's for sure. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for having me well, on. I, I appreciate you and all that you do. And, you know, people don't realize how much energy goes on to putting on just a single podcast. So, uh, and really what you have to do every day is continue to grow, find people grow so that you can keep elevating the conversation, which I know you're doing. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. Thanks, Adam.